eyes on our Pharaoh. Take your head, gather your bones, and shake the earth from your flesh. One of the great conundrums of the ancient world is how it all began. The first cities on earth were built in the marshlands of Mesopotamia, southern Iraq, by a mysterious people we call the Sumerians. This was in about 3500 BC. Within a century or so, on the banks of the river Nile, an equally mysterious clan known as the followers of Horus suddenly appeared. Within a relatively short time, they had conquered the whole of Egypt, and their rulers, the Horus kings, became the first pharaohs. What was the spark which ignited Egyptian civilization? And who were the followers of Horus? These are just two of the major questions which we'll seek to answer in a major two-part documentary series entitled The Egyptian Genesis. Egypt is a land of wonders. But its origins remain a mystery. The Egyptian Genesis will uncover extraordinary evidence to show that the followers of Horus were in fact adventurers from ancient Sumer, who had journeyed by sea to Egypt in search of a new homeland. In an amazing feat of skill and endurance, they dragged their large reed ships from the Red Sea to the Nile through the sandstone canyons of the Eastern Desert. With these ocean-going battleships launched into the River Nile, they easily conquered the indigenous Egyptians, establishing the pharaonic state which went on to build the mighty pyramids. Program 1 begins in the Valley of the Kings, where Egyptologist David Roll, that's me, reveals the amazing imagery of the pharaonic underworld. All over the walls of the royal tombs are ships carrying strange symbols. What does all this mean? By the end of the first program, it will be clear that the mythology of the Egyptian afterlife represents the return journey of Pharaoh's spirit from Egypt back to the homeland of his primeval ancestors eastwards to the Isle of Flame, where the sun is resurrected every day and where the gods were born. For the last five years, I've been exploring the vast expanse of Egypt's eastern desert between the Nile and Red Sea in search of prehistoric rock art. Hundreds of sites have been found where ancient artists carved depictions of hunting scenes, men with tall plumes on their heads, and above all, high proud ships, thousands of them. What are they doing in the bone dry desert? That's the question, and one which the central part of this first program will endeavor to explain. It's my view, and there's lots of evidence to back it up, that these are Mesopotamian ships, bringing invaders from the east. will show that they're intimately linked with the legendary followers of Horus and that their leader became the ruler of a new kingdom based in southern Egypt, near the site where the Temple of Edfu now stands, dedicated to the falcon god Horus.
a CGI sequence will bring to life the amazing accomplishment of the dragging of high proud ships through the desert canyons. Ancient artifacts found in pre-dynastic Egypt are shown to have Sumerian origins. It's the same for the monumental architecture of early Egyptian civilization, which has its precursor in the cities of Mesopotamia. We'll transport the viewer to the dusty plains of southern Iraq, to archaeological sites which have not been filmed since the advent of modern television. Here we'll see the originals from which the Egyptian versions were copied. Finally, at the end of program one, I'll pose the major questions which have arisen from what we know so far. Why did the Sumerians make the dangerous journey to Egypt? And how did they get there? Program two begins with a recap of what we've revealed in the previous hour. We then introduce the audience to the legends of Mesopotamia and the biblical book of Genesis regarding the foundation of civilization and how it was all destroyed in the Great Flood. Out of that terrible disaster grew an even more powerful kingdom under the leadership of Nimrod, the mighty hunter and the first potentate on earth, as the Bible calls him. We'll identify Nimrod with Enmer Kar, ruler of Uruk, the greatest of the Sumerian cities. This great king of Sumer was the grandfather of the hero Gilgamesh. Enmer Kar built the Tower of Babel, which will be reconstructed using CGI from the original excavation data. Archaeology has revealed that during the Uruk period, the time of Enmer Kar, Sumerian colonies were being established in the far-flung corners of the world. Not long after, the heartland of Sumer itself was abandoned and the great building program, including the Tower of Babel, came to a halt. This was precisely the time that the followers of Horus appear in the Nile Valley. It looks as if these newcomers to Egypt were refugees from Mesopotamia, the kinfolk of Nimrod, and through him, the descendants of the flood hero, Noah. The climax of the series will bring all the archeological detective work together to show that the religion of the pharaohs was based on a distant memory of a dreamlike past at the dawn of history. This was the era of the Egyptian Genesis, which the pharaohs called the first time when gods and heroes walked the earth. We're going to talk about the origins of Egyptian civilization from the East, which is something that's never really talked about. So just to remind you uh, what we did on the previous talk on the Friday night, um, which was basically looking at the origins of this idea of the bringing of knowledge to Egypt by Thoth and the Seven Sages. And I introduce you to uh, a little-known inscription from Edfu, uh, dealing with a people called the Shebtiu. And the Shebtiu were the the original founders of Egyptian civilization who came from afar. And this is during our 2001 uh, Egyptian Genesis program making. We actually got on top of the temple wall at Edfu in order to photograph and film this row of gods here, which is very high up on the Pronaos. And just to remind you, one or two of their titles, the three front runners in the, and the eight are very important and the most important of the, of the eight gods. The first one is called Wa or Wa. And that translates into Egyptian as the distant one. And that also happens to be the epithet for Utnapishtim, and Zeusudra and Atrahasis, the three flood heroes. And it is also uh, what the name Horus means. It means the far distant. So there is a connection probably between that and this original very old word, Wa. And then we have the second of the two gods, and this is Ah, and that means the great one and one might imagine who the Great One 
might be in the early pantheon of Egyptian gods. And it could, in fact, actually be Thoth himself. That is a possibility. And then the third one, and I think it's the one we're going to have to concentrate on our minds on, is this word nai, which means sailor or navigator. And so we're dealing with something to do with crossing seas with these gods. And they have some very interesting epithets. Let's just remind ourselves, the August Sheptu. Sheptu means senior ones, the most senior. They're called the children of Chenen, which is the risen land, the primeval mound upon which everything was created in the beginning, in Septepi. And they're called the offspring of Artum, the creator god, the great god of Egypt, the primeval god of Egypt. And they're called the glorious spirits of the early primeval age. So we're going back to Septepi, we're going back to the beginnings of memory the beginnings of myth and legend. And they're also associated very po pointedly with building. They are great builders and designers of buildings. They teach building to the Egyptians. They show them the knowledge of building. And importantly, they're the brethren sages, and there are seven in number. And they are led by Thoth. So that's what the Sheb to you are. These are Thoth and the seven sages. These are the bringers of knowledge to Egypt. So let's ask a few questions. I'm sorry you can't really see this. Problem. You've actually got sunshine at last, <laughs> but that means you can't see the screen. Can you make out Akhenaten here and Ramesses II? Uh -huh. What's weird about these guys and all the pharaohs is they have heavy beards, but they're not real beards. They're attached to their chins. Why do pharaohs wear beards? Native Egyptians don't grow beards. So why do they attach beards to give them something special and different to the ordinary people of Egypt? Let's ask another question. Why are the high proud reed ships illustrated in the tombs and even represented in the great boat, the Khufu boat, which takes the, the god, the deceased god now, through the underworld to the, to the eastern horizon to be reborn again? And why do we see these types of reed ships with a high prow and high stern in the tombs, like the one here at Thutmose III's tomb? You can just about make out the reed bundle tied together here, and the shape of this boat is very important to remember, with the pharaoh, the deceased pharaoh, traveling through the underworld into the rebirth. And you'll notice at the front, this is enlarged here, there are two standards. There's the standard of Horus, the falcon, the, the standard of the twin plumes. Now, those come into play when we go back to prehistoric times. And why is it that in the rituals in Egypt, the gods are carried about in boats? They're never shown depicted on water. They're always shown being carried aloft or dragged along. Why are boats so important, these sacred barks, to Egyptian religion and kingship? And you see, in the tombs of the pharaohs, you see these high-proud boats with the central cabin with the <coughs> god Artem in, the ancient creator god in, and they're, being, they're not on water, they're on desert land, and they're being dragged along by the crew of the boat. So, what I said in the previous talk was, is that resurrection and rebirth, in terms of the Egyptian theology, lie in the east. Death is in the west. That's where the body is left behind. Rebirth and resurrection is in the east with the rising sun. So I'm going to take you eastwards from Egypt to show you what's been found between Egypt and the Red Sea, because it's very important material that's hardly known about in Egyptological terms, and probably you don't know about it yourselves. So we're going into the eastern desert, where you're going to find some very interesting material to look at. The eastern desert itself uh, it stretches all the way up to the Wadi Chumalat in the north, and down towards Aswan in the south. But basically, the, the area we're going to concentrate on is from the Kenna Bend, where Thebes is located, down to uh, here, that, that Aswan High Dam, or, the, or Aswan at the bottom there. And that section, going over to the Red Sea, is what we're going to concentrate on. You'll notice, if you can see it, that we're talking about two so locations of a prehistoric Egypt. This is the city of Nubt, or Gold Town, which is where Seth was worshipped. So this is the the followers of Seth, and down here at Neken, near Edfu, which is Horus's temple, is the city of Horus, where the Horus worshippers were located. And that conflict between Horus and Seth is actually an allegory for a battle of 
conflict between those two groups of people. And what's interesting about those two groups is they're opposite two major transverse wadi routes to the Red Sea and also to the gold mines, which are located here and here, the gold mines. And so you have routes going through from uh, Nek and Edfu all the way across the Red Sea, and you have routes going from Nut and Kuft all the way to Kusair in the north. So why are the two major kingdoms of prehistoric Egypt located opposite those two wadis? Because those two wadis are crucial for connections to somewhere else. Now, um, I got interested in this guy, Arthur Weigel, who was an Egyptologist knocking about in Egypt in the beginning of the 20th century. And in 1907, he decided to get married to an American lady called Hortense, and he took her for honeymoon out into the desert. Great honeymoon, but uh, they went out to look at a temple, which I'm going to show you in a second. His book that he was pu published about that experience is called Travels in the Upper Egyptian Desert. And though it's a rather flowery book, it's a very interesting book to read for what it contains. And so he went out, actually, and surveyed and looked at this area. He went to the Temple of Canaïs down here, which I'm going to show you a picture of in a minute. And it's this area that we began our research in, but then we then extended our survey work up into the Wadi Hammamat region to cover the whole area. The Wadi Hammamat area was um, discovered and explored by Hans Winkler, a German um, explorer, just before the beginning of the Second World War. So we have these two zones, if you like, two discoverers, two, two uh, explorers, and two zones of material to look at. And what we did was, it was um, probably the, the, the sort of 1990s, late 1990s, we began to do survey work out in the desert, taking four-wheel drives out there and spending usually about a week at a time because uh, it's very difficult to sustain yourself beyond, beyond a week. You run out of water. The bread you take with you becomes like leather. And your back starts to hurt after seven days lying on the hard desert sand. So after a week, we usually come back. But we go out there. And we look, we look for whatever we can find in the very rocky terrain, which is the eastern desert. You know, it's not very easy to see that. But what you have here is, if I can see it, is the Nile Valley. This is an angular angle shot. And the Red Sea to that distance over there. The Kennebend and Luxe is located here. And Edfu down there. And what happened was Arthur Weigel took his wife by train down to Edfu. And then they got a couple of camels. And then they followed the Wadi route all the way up to this place called Canais, which is quite a long way into the eastern desert here. And at that location, they found a, a beautiful little Speos temple, which I hope I can show you. It'll work. There we go. You can't really see it. Can you see this temple over here? It's a Speos temple. It's a rock-cut temple cut into the rock. And it's built, it was built by Seti I to commemorate the digging of a well for his army to go to the gold mines and to bring gold back to the Nile Valley.